The national economically active population is really an indication of what the workplace looks like in terms of race and in terms of gender. And currently it looks as follows. African males, 41.7%. African females, 34.6%. Which gives a total of 76.2% of Africans in the workplace. Colored people, we're looking at 5.7% male, 4.9% female, giving us 106 The Indian population, 1.8 male and 1% female, giving us a total EAP of 2.8 of the Indian population. And then the white population, we're looking at 5.8 male and 4.5 female, giving it a total of 10.3% in total. This is a very important uh, table because when we look at reports and we start commenting as a commission, we really look to the EAP to guide us as to where we're at in terms of transformation as opposed to where we should be. This information is given to us by Stats SA. Let's first look at top management in terms of race. If we look, and we, we're looking at 2010, 2012, and 2014. 2010, we had 12.7% African population at top management. 2014, 136 with 2012 having been 12.3. So what actually happened between 2012 and 2010 was that there was slight decrease, and my, my predecessor often talks to this as the random walk phenomenon where things get better and then they get worse and there is no plausible explanation as to why things are happening the way they are. However, if you look at the trend, it's taking an upward trend. By 20, 2014, we're sitting at 13.6. And then the white population at top management was at 73.1 in 2010 and is currently at 70%. So between 2010 and 2014, it's decreased by just about 3%. And if you go back to the previous slide where we show the EAP, you will see that currently Af the African population is at 76.2, while the white population is at 10.3. But look what is happening at top management. Moving on to senior management, first talking in terms of race. Again, I'm using the same comparisons. The African population in 2010 was at 12.7, currently sitting at 20.5. We're beginning to see quite a bit of a jump if you compare it with top management. And at 2012, it was at 18.4. The white population at senior management was at 73.1, moved to 63.4, and is at 59.3 by 2014. I'll now move on to the professionally qualified. And I need to state that the professionally qualified level as well as the skilled technical levels are very encouraging. That's where we see the most change in terms of demographics, in terms of uh, race, as well as in terms of gender. Let me just pause at this stage and talk to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Goal number five talks to um, gender representation. And in terms of that, and with South Africa being a member, the target for 2030 is that there will be 50-50 representation at all levels, or all occupational levels. The target is every country will have a 50-50 representation of gender. And if you look at the skill technical level, if we take these reports as representative of what is happening in the workplace, one can make the assumption that we are moving in the right direction and that South Africa may actually achieve that at the skill technical level sooner than 2030. Where we at, as a commission, we're saying it's all very well to report about statistics. It's all very well to report on affirmative action and movement in terms of entry or promotion of staff. 
But at the moment in South Africa, we're faced with a number of dynamics, and Justice has spoken about a lot of them, one of which is the issue of racism. Now, when you look at the issue of racism, you, you would know that the workplace is a part of the society. So some of the things that we would see and some of the noises that we would hear, we would also hear in the workplace. So as a commission, we started refocusing and saying to ourselves, how do we make sure that we eliminate unfair discrimination? How do we make sure that there's inclusivity in the workplace? But the perception is that affirmative action is tokenism. And that's not true. So to a large extent, there is a perception that People that come in as affirmative action candidates are token. They're brought in just to make the numbers of the organization look good. With the superficial compliance, you find more or less of the, the same issues. Very little has changed. And in fact, the, the white believe that the blacks are tokens and the black feel underutilized. They feel not trusted. And so the vicious circle goes on. But the third, this scenario for me, the effective employment equity scenario, is a scenario that I believe we all need to be working towards. I feel that organizations, before they become preoccupied about reporting, need to be preoccupied about creating this environment. Because more often than not, we have people coming in and leaving as soon as they've come in because the environment is not enabling and it's not inclusive. So in, in this environment, there is no group that is in power. There's an integrated culture. Working together is in the interest of the business. No one feels alienated or marginalized. We've gone beyond being politically correct to really good faith in our interactions with each other. No one is insecure except the non-performers because we will get them out as a team. Emphasis is on job-related characteristics rather than on stereotypes provide challenging development opportunities according to the individual strength and weaknesses. The purpose of EE is being achieved, but at a very slow pace. The goal of substantive equality within the setting of affirmative action is to remove both the visible and the invisible barriers. And I think as a country, we've been so obsessed at focusing at the things that we see, the changes in the numbers, that we're forgetting to go back and saying, in order for us to have those sustainable changes, what do we need to be doing? And that's where the challenge is. So if one looks at employment equity from that perspective, one would say we're not achieving what we should be achieving. But on the other side, one would look at the statistics and say there is growth in some cases. Very often, we may be politically correct in the public forums, but what happens in the price? And doesn't that impact on the way in which we make decisions? And for me, then I'm believing that this is the way going forward. Going forward, we need to confront the reality of our upbringing, the reality of our cultures, the reality of where and how we believe and think about people, and get to a place of saying, if this is our reality, how do we overcome all these obstacles in order for the EEA to achieve what it ought to achieve? I think there's huge opportunity, but we need everyone to work together to say, what have we done wrong in the last 20 years? And what are we going to do right? How are we going to build this house correct now? Because if we don't build it correct, it'll just fall down again. And I think to be here for me and for you, Tembi, as commissioners, it's critically important that we look at the successes. We shout from the mountaintops of the successes that have happened. We acknowledge the failures and correct those failures. And of course, if people then don't want to correct the failures, then of course the fine's appropriate. 20 years down the line, we're still having these um, issues. And I believe that is why we still have um, slow progress, because we have people who don't know their rights. We have companies who don't know how to implement. And we have, obviously, as um, Tabia said, challenges of um, you know, people who are still um, refusing to um, acknowledge people for who they are. So I think the issue of diversity and inclusivity for me is a big issue in terms of transformation in our country. We have beautiful legislations that are inclusive, that are trying to include everyone. You know, employment equity, that says that we must implement equitable representation of all people without um, unfairly discriminating against people. But our policies are not 
um, in line with that. And if we do have policies, the practice is, is shocking that you have companies that are still with line managers who are still refusing to employ people um, because they're not like them and um, or they don't believe that they will be strong enough. And I'm saying, but how are we going to actually reduce the inequalities if we are not giving people? Legislation says that we must look at suitably qualified people and suitably qualified being a person with one or a combination of various um, aspect, qualification, experience, um, recognition of prior learning and potential. And I'm saying if we don't look at potential, we are never going to have equality. We need to actually align our strategies with um, what we do as business, but without um, compromising quality, obviously. We have seen um, a growth in skill technical because most businesses have actually tried to actually accept the fact that we have to um, to comply with broad-based black economic empowerment because that's a license to trade. So those statistics have actually increased because there is also that indirect force that is happening. And of course we've got opportunities now with the Skills Development Act that says that you can um, train unemployed. And I say why not take that opportunity? Why are we looking at compliance as a threat? Let's look at compliance as an opportunity because we do have opportunity to actually change um, these um, statistics um, as businesses, which in, in the long run is actually going to change the diversity of our workplaces. And I do believe that you know diversity is obviously a, a value add because um, we learn something new from different people. I'm just encouraging the commission to say, future and current commissioners to say let's work with businesses where there are opportunities. Obviously if businesses don't want to work with the department and work with the rollout then there should be a compliance issue. But it's a multifaceted problem. I went to a launch to be a where you launched two years ago the report and I already felt sick after that because everyone was blaming business and no one's saying well this is a we need to have this in Darbo. What Casey you saying the right thing. We need to bring in the CETAs, the educational facilities, basic and high education. We need to see where the problems are and lock the blockages because you can't do it alone. And that's why I'm saying to business that I consult for, maybe your own internal colleges like the NAMPAC colleges, you need to b bump up because in the interim, unless the departments come to the picture, the functional departments, we need to work with the functional ones, then we'll have to do our own thing because it's the only way we're going to achieve the right people for our businesses.